There goes Facebook. Facebook, there you go, Facebook. All right. All right. All right, perfect, perfect, perfect. Hey, guys, how you doing? Had a little glitch. My Facebook wasn't trying to cooperate. I don't know what happened. Maybe NSA saw me out there or something. You know how they do us in progressive media. If you don't know, my name is Tim Black. I'm the host of the Tim Black at Night show. And today I have a special guest. He is a humanitarian. He's also the national organizer for the Black Alliance for Peace. He's a uh, in 2016. He was the uh, Green Party nominee for vice president, and is also a dear friend of mine, ladies and gentlemen, Ajambo Baraka. Hey, Ajambo, how you doing, brother? I'm doing well, brother Tim. I'm so happy you uh, brought me back. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for for quite some time. So. Uh, Thank you for uh, remembering me and bringing me back. Man, the John Moody, like I said, there are people I'd like to forget. You are definitely not in that number, my brother, man. You you inspire me, and and uh, I definitely, definitely wanted to have you back, man. And uh, thank you for taking time out your schedule, man, because you, you are doing some amazing things, Ajamu. I'm just trying to serve the people, brother. That's that, See what I mean? See what I mean, ladies and gentlemen. See what I mean. You see what I'm talking about? That's the spirit. That's the spirit of Jamu has, man. That's the spirit. Now, now a Jamu man. Uh, just to get up to speed, um, you told me you were in Colombia, and you told me about some issues in Colombia. Let's jump jump right into it, man. What is happening? What's what's the concerns? Well, you know, um, perhaps I'm quite sure that your your um, viewers know that uh, Colombia is a very uh, complex situation. Uh, it is a, a country that was uh, um, involved in a uh, conflict, a civil war basically for more than 50 years. Um, there's a peace process that's in place or developing, um, uh, but there's some problems. Um, you're, you, they also may know that in Colombia, we have the third largest a black community outside of Africa. You have uh, uh, Brazil, number one, the U.S., number two, and number three, in fact, is Colombia. So there is a very intense struggle in Colombia among the black community, fighting for land rights, uh, fighting for autonomy and self-determination, uh, fighting to maintain their, their way of life. And they've been severely impacted by this war for the last 50 years. Uh, but they thought that there was some degree of hope uh, for the peace process. Uh, but they are finding that um, the commitment to peace is not as strong as uh, they would like for it to be. And just recently, a few of the activists, uh, two black women, a mother and daughter team, uh, were arrested um, and accused of being um, members of an illegal organization. So it's very hot here uh, in Colombia, very intense struggle, uh, like it is in so many parts of the world. Yeah, you, you know, you inf- you inform me of what's going on currently, and you uh, you brought to my attention the two young ladies. So there's an illegal organization. I, I guess it's contrary to the government, like it's it's a protest <clears throat> organization that they sit, that they say that they're a part of, but they're not a part of that organization, from what I understand. Well, there, there's there is um you know again, Colombia has um, been having a lot of armed conflict, so there are a couple of. Um, of, of what they call guerrilla organizations that are, they have taken up the mantle of, of revolutionary armed struggle. And they are being, the main one of course was, was FARC. Uh, that was the main organization. That's the one that the government has a, is developing a peace accord with. Uh, they're the ones that were primarily fighting the government for these last five decades. Uh, there's another organization, uh, ELN, uh, that is also a guerrilla organization. Um, that took up armed armed struggle, uh, and so they're being accused of being members of that organization. So they, uh, the Colombian authorities, consider both of those groups to be uh, quote unquote terrorist organizations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But see, what's what's happening, Tim, is that this is an, an attempt to try to um, criminalize the the black oppositional movement in the country uh, by. Uh, uh, scandalizing it by suggesting that its its leaders are in fact involved in criminal activity, uh, being a part of a criminal uh, organization, engaging in criminal activity like narco trafficking. So, 
uh, there's been mobilization uh, really internationally to bring attention to the case. Um, the Black Alliance for Peace has been involved in helping to publicize the situation. Um, uh, we have a, a letter uh, that was circulating that was uh, uh, delivered to the authorities. Uh, there are people that are developing uh, 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 legal defense um, uh, funds and apparatuses. So um, this is just what many of us believe may be the opening blow, uh, the opening salvo against um, this very important black organization. You know, as you described it, Ajamu, I was thinking about the the latest attempts to do the same here in the United States with the attacks on what they call black identity extremists. You know, the- exactly. I mean, it, it's it's when when you have people who are organizing to to defend their fundamental human rights, um, then the the these the states will then uh, attempt to try to decapitate the the leadership. Uh, they will try to. Re, uh, 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 separate the organizations from the people. And the way you do that is to uh, imply that these organizations, these attempts to organize people are as part of some nefarious um, uh, plot and that the motivations of the people who are organizing uh, should be uh, questioned. So those kinds of, of, of labels, the black identity extremists uh, is the US version of what we see unfolding here in Colombia. It's just uh, just horrendous, you know. Um, you know, we, we're seeing censorship now, even trying to get the word out as, as we try to publicize and and try to give voices to those who are not, you know, to the voiceless. And, and you know, you know, that's you know what's going on here in the United States. I can only imagine, you know, you know, the situation in Colombia. So, your your Black Alliance, uh, Black Alliance for Peace. What does that organization do? How does it operate? Well, you know. Um we, we launched the Black Alliance for Peace uh, basically a year ago, mm. um, on April the 4th of last year. We saw that as, um, as of course, the, the anniversary of the assassination of, of Dr. King. Well, last year, it was the anniversary of Dr. King's famous speech uh, at Riverside Church, where he uh, came out in opposition to the Vietnam War. Mm. And we thought that was an appropriate uh, uh, 50th anniversary to launch a new uh, black anti-war movement. So we launched last year, April the 4th, uh, and the intent of this movement is to attempt to rebuild the traditional black uh, opposition to uh, to war, uh, to imperialism, and to domestic repression. Um, using uh, and up, up, upholding Dr. King and his uh, moral uh, opposition to, uh, to the war in Vietnam, his analysis that said uh, 50 years ago in that speech, uh, that uh, he had to come to the painful conclusion that uh, the greatest purveyor of violence on the planet was his government, the United States of America. And we said it is uh, more than ir- ironic that 50 years later, that appears to still be the case. So we felt that it was important for us to begin to recapture that uh, that spirit of opposition. Uh, we know that uh, after eight years of of, of uh, our first black president, uh, mm-hmm. that the black community had become somewhat conservative in the sense that, you know, Tim, you, I know you, you, you old enough to remember that black folks always had a very suspicious approach to the US uh, government, its adventures outside of, of the borders of the US. Um, when the, the government said, said one thing, we would look at the opposite uh, because we knew that uh, this state uh, had a, a tradition of not being honest. Uh, we knew that this state had a tradition of not being on the right side of history and the right side in terms of upholding people's uh, human rights. Uh, but under the Obama administration, because he was in fact the face of government, uh, we we started to lose that edge, that that critical uh, approach to uh, to the activities and the adventures of the U.S. state. So we, we felt that uh, with Obama now um, um, gone, mm-hmm. then maybe we can recapture that critical spirit because it's, it's fundamentally important that we do that because you know war is a, uh, an issue that impacts black and poor people, working class people disproportionately than anybody else. So when, when the state is involved in a conflict and they're sending uh, uh, the troops 
uh, who are those troops besides working working class people and the poor, Absolutely. and primarily black folks and brown folks? So uh, being anti-war is not some uh, exotic sort of uh, add-on to our activism. We say that being anti-war is fundamentally uh, important, is vital to any kind of movement for social change. So we start building this alliance, um, and we uh, have been successful in expanding the ranks. Uh, and we have been also a driving force in attempting to rebuild the broader anti-war movement here uh, in this country. Uh, the Black Alliance for Peace, just in this this one this, this one year, uh, has emerged as one of the uh, leadership uh, elements in uh, trying to rebuild the broader Black, the broader anti-war movement. That is. So um, we are building uh, consciousness. We are building opposition uh, to uh, U.S. militarism abroad. But Tim, we also are connecting that up with our concern with militarism domestically. We say that we're anti-war and we're anti-repression. We say that uh, militarism we see in these urban areas, in these uh, with these police departments, is just the flip side of the kind of militarism we see uh, abroad, of uh, uh, two sides of the same repressive coin. That's why we see no in standing with uh, oppressed people and our brothers and sisters in Colombia, uh, with uh, people in Honduras, uh, in Yemen, uh, and, and uh, Saudi Arabia, wherever. You know, some people say, "Well, Ajama, why is it the Black Alliance for Peace is uh, putting out statements on on Syria and and Afghanistan and other?" Because that is our tradition. You know, the Black radical tradition has a tradition of internationalism. We understand that we're up against a global oppressive structure. So we can't just be focused in on the US. Malcolm said years ago, you can't understand Mississippi unless you understand the Congo. Mm. And you can't understand the Congo unless you understand Mississippi. That is the kind of international perspective that's always been a part of our movement. So we're trying to recapture that spirit. And we've been pretty successful over this last year uh, with very little money, uh, no, re no real uh, staff, uh, and but we have a, a moral force, and so we are now we have uh, uh, organizations across the country. We have uh, uh, collectives developing in a number of different cities, uh, and so we are building this uh, this movement. And what happened today is a perfect example of why we have to have a more powerful anti-war movement uh, with the uh, the ripping up of the uh, Iran nuclear deal uh, by this administration, which means now that. Uh, the U.S. is now closer to either a direct or indirect conflict, military conflict uh, with Iran. So we've got to demonstrate to the administration uh, and demonstrate to the people in general that there is um, numbers of people in this country who are not going to allow themselves to be uh, taken down a path to war. Well, well, you, you know, a couple of points, man. When you when you brought up Barack Obama, uh, I couldn't help but think how masterful it was a play to uh, to give him the presidency. Um, how he was able to disguise himself as if he was a you know he's going to champion for for uh, poor people and champion for uh, blacks, of course, uh, because he appeared he had the veneer of uh, of a black you know like, like you know he's associated with blacks and he's a, he appeared to be black and this is his thing and he appears to be fighting for the people as being a a, a community organizer and uh, being from the tough Chicago and and then he went right in and folded like a lawn chair and. It was difficult, man. You may recall, Jamu, in 2016, you know, I supported you and Jill, Jill Stein, because you were the only party that I saw that was fighting for the people. You know, to me, it was no choice at all. But problem was uh, getting people to, to know who you to know who you were uh, because of the blackout, the media blackout, as you described. So the media worked against that. But my thing is, it's very difficult for, for people to look past their own circumstances and see the, the, you know the international issues um and how and how you're right that when, I, I appreciate so much you mentioning that quote because I get the same thing some people ask me is Jama going to talk about Detroit you know is he going to talk about Flint I think we're going to get to that but um yeah, I I understand your point and um uh just briefly on the uh Trump thing I ask you this so they're framing this as if Trump is going to get a better deal like uh, he had like the the Iran deal wasn't good enough for him, 
So he wants to go back to the table and renegotiate. And what what, what I need clarity on is that um, the fact that we have Merkel, you know, going at him and disagreeing with his move and, and um, many others and a lot of the Democrats, that kind of gives me pause. Um, why do you think he pulled out of that deal? Besides to make Obama look stupid, it's besides to undercut Obama, because anything Obama did, he wants to reverse. What's your opinion on that? I think there's some powerful, powerful elements in the um, uh, Trump administration and in the foreign policy community uh, that were never um, in favor of the Iranian deal uh, because they are more committed to policies that enhance the power of Israel then advances the interest, the objective interest of the United States of America. Uh, and so they were all, always um, opposed to any kind of uh, a real deal with Iran. In fact, they opposed it as the Obama administration was, in fact, negotiating it. Uh, but uh, those elements have been successful in uh, whispering in Trump's ear um, and persuading him that if he pulled out of this deal that was brokered by uh, five European nations uh, and the Chinese and the Russians uh, that he could bully them into a, a more restrictive deal. Uh, that's not really going to happen. And look, the, re the real issue that Trump has with uh, and these powerful forces, again, is not so much the fact that they're concerned about um, Iran developing a nuclear weapon, because even U.S. intelligence um, verified that the Iranian nuclear program was not, in fact, a program that was leading toward the development of a nuclear bomb. That was concluded by U.S. intelligence, okay? Their real concern with the Iranians is connected to Iranian power and the uh, support that uh, Hezbollah gets from the Iranians. And we know that Hezbollah is the a sworn enemy uh, of Israel. of uh, Israel. vice versa. Israel. Uh, so the concern with with Iran is trying to undermine Iranian uh, influence in the Middle East and primarily in Syria, uh, because they see if they can uh, destroy the Syrian government, uh, then that goes a long way in undercutting uh, Iranian influence in the so-called Middle East. So it's about it. It keeps on coming back to enhancing the power of, of Israel. It's a very dangerous move they're making because, um, you know, they're getting ready to really isolate themselves uh, and undercut their support, even from their allies, because part of the, of the sanction regime they want to reimpose is uh, to force the uh, European governments and businesses uh, not to do business with Iran, which means uh, they're going to be losing millions and billions of dollars. And already the Europeans are like, well, you know, hey, what's going on here? Is this another example of American first? You know, and when do we start looking out for our own interests? So it's, 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 a, it's a straight up gangster move by the Trump administration. But in their, in their inability to think this thing all the way through, uh, I think it's, one of, it's, it's going to be one of the most um, uh, critical mistakes uh, that they made so far and one of the most critical mistakes ever made by an administration. You know why, also, Tim? How are you going to uh, uh, demonstrate that uh, you can be a reliable uh, partner in an international agreement um, uh, with, with, with the North Koreans mm. when mm -hmm. you have you just torn up a uh, uh, an agreement that was brokered by, by all these nations over a period of a decade? So this notion you're going to go and, and negotiate uh, and, and bully a, a country, a state, North Korea, that already has nuclear weapons and force them into some kind of compromise is absurd. So they have undercut uh, any ability, in my opinion, to, to, to come out of it in a, with an agreement uh, with the North, North Koreans to denuclearize the Korean, uh, Korean Peninsula. It's not gonna happen. In fact, uh, the North Korean leadership would be uh, suicidal to conclude an agreement uh, with a, a government that seems to be as erratic uh, and reckless as this one. Uh, 
Wow. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I've been hearing people talk of uh, giving Trump a lot of credit for the the talks, the peace talks that are going on between South Korea and North Korea, and they're even discussing him getting a Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what to say about but, that. That even even that. I, I, you know, we got to push back on that too. You know why? Because what they are suggesting is that they are they are suggesting that this uh, aggressive bullying kind of, of, of policies that they that the uh, Trump administration advanced that that was the the element that pushed the uh, North Koreans to 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 the uh, to ne- to negotiate that's not really that's a misreading of what's happening and what happened that basically the North Koreans demonstrated that they had a credible nuclear deterrent mm-hmm. therefore they were in a position to engage in a uh, a discussion as a powerful uh, uh, nation that demanded uh, um, uh, to be treated as an equal, in essence. Wow. So you can you can negotiate at that point. You negotiated from a, a position of power. So it wasn't it wasn't that uh, uh, white buana uh, bullying that they're trying to advance. Like like ain't nobody scared of the U.S. anymore. Mm. People need to get that through their heads. You, you ain't scared. Look, it, like and Malcolm pointed it out also, he said, he said that the, the Europeans are not going to win another war and they have not won another war since World War II. If you eliminate, if you count, if you discount, uh, you know, the, the going into Grenada in 83 uh, and Panama in 89, third world uh, countries with no real military, where has the U.S. won? They lost in Afghanistan. They're just not telling, telling uh, folks. They lost in Iraq. They're losing in Syria. Where oh, have they won? Oh, Jamal, man, I thought we had mission accomplished nobody, in Iraq. We had mission accomplished flags in Iraq, man. What you talk about? We didn't win Iraq. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. And, and, that's, and, 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 and we're building 16 permanent bases because they weren't, lo- they weren't, they weren't going to leave. But they ain't there now. Well, they stuck back through the back door. Uh, once they they created this uh, this ISIS threat, mm-hmm. that gave them the leverage to uh, to go back into Iraq, basically, um, and that's why they also are illegally occupying in Syria. Uh, they're using this uh, threat of ISIS uh, in order to illegally uh, go into Syria and occupy uh, that country. So yeah, you know they back, but in a in a in a minor way. Yeah, I said, I, yeah. Um, I don't want to jump too far, but I would like to talk to you about Syria and the idea that Assad would gas his own people um, at, at such a juncture. Like he's winning the war against ISIS, and and uh, and and where I think a, a Trump had announced that we were uh, pulling away, and, and then this chemical attack came out of nowhere. Do you have thoughts on that? A week after uh, Trump, it, it was reported. That Trump uh, had in, had uh, uh, instructed the military to begin to develop plans for how to uh, withdraw from Syria. A week later, as you said in your question, um, as the the Syrian army is on the on the the eve of complete military um, uh, victory, they decide you know it must be because they must be these dumbass Arabs. They decide that they're going to use chemical weapons to evoke an international response and give a pretext for even an invasion. I mean, who besides a, a, a white supremacist mm-hmm. would believe that kind of crap? That's exactly but what they I was think thinking. that the American people are, uh, they think the American people are so ignorant. Now it, it you know, so it made no sense. And what's, what was what's incredible is that you have people who should know better in this country who given um, uh, credence to that kind of interpretation. It is backward and it's also racist. It makes no sense. Right, and for anybody who doesn't... Not... They don't want to leave Syria. What's that? They don't want to leave Syria. They, they have to have some kind of pretext to try to stay in Syria. So they don't want the war in fact to end. Because once the war ends, then basically there'd be real pressure on the U.S. to, to get out. And those powerful elements in the in the in the deep state um, that have that are manipulating these these events 
Uh, they are trying to create the conditions for the U.S. to stay in Syria and to stay in Iraq. Yeah, um, I, I was doing some research on the side, and I realized he's a doctor. You know, he's an intelligent man. He a lot of schooling, um, went to the best schools. And, and for some people to believe, like you stated, Ajamo, that he is that ignorant, that he would make such a horrible, horrible play, like he has no strategy, he has no one around him with a better strategy. Uh, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it's something I've been thinking for a while. That's r- truly racism. To say, well, he can't, you know, he's not strategic. He can't be strategic because uh, he's a he's a brown man from that side of the world. So, yeah, I, I, that, that's how that very troubling, man, very troubling. But you know, a large amount of Americans believe it, and the Democratic Party is pushing it, and and to the point where you get attacked, uh, uh, Jamu, if you if you state. Uh, which you just stated, which is it didn't make any sense, and that you know, show, I say, show me the proof. Like I, I get attacked so much, Ajamo, I don't even like I don't go direct and say you're wrong. I say, well, prove it to me, and they have yet to prove it to me. They, they, and they can't prove it to you because there's no there's no proof. Just like they they can't really prove that there was a, an attack in London uh, by the Russians. So this this is all part of the information warfare that we uh, we involved in. Uh, and is, is a very cynical and dangerous uh, warfare because uh, the object is to manipulate uh, the people to support these these aggressive military um, adventures. Now, you know, you, you mentioned about the connection, or you suggested the connection between all these events. Yes. And something like Detroit or Flint. Yes, sir. And this is how we see the connection from the uh, Black Alliance for Peace. That basically. We cannot address the material needs of poor people and working class people in the U.S. as long as uh, our resources are being stolen from us by the military industrial complex. That we have a situation, for example, where they, both parties, uh, gave the military a a boost of $80 billion. The the, uh, defense budget now is over uh, seven hundred billion dollars, um, and that money that could be used for uh, for repairing the roads and bridges, uh, expanding um, uh, and strengthening uh, the, the education and 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 and, and building, giving giving um, um, uh, races to teachers, um, cleaning up the environment, you know, uh, <clears throat> job training, uh, expanding health facilities. All of those things are not being done because the states say they have no money and the national government says they have no money, but yet they have money for for the military. So you have people in Flint who still are are subjected to uh, those conditions, but they still don't have clean water. You get people in Detroit who who can't get jobs and schools are crumbling. You saw the you saw the picture in in Baltimore uh, during the wintertime where the kids went inside the uh, schoolhouse. In, in coats, yes. you know, that's how they do the people when we disorganize and we allow them to manipulate us into believing that uh, the, the interests of the 1% are in fact the national interest and that we have these external enemies that require uh, uh, us to spend almost 60 cents of every dollar on the military. So, you know, we've got to make the proper connections. We've got to understand that these issues are connected. We got to understand that the militarism and the war being waged uh, externally is a mirror of the war being waged against us internally. There's a reason why they have transferred billions of dollars from the military in surplus equipment to these police forces, militarizing these police forces. Have you seen these police forces? They look like the military. They have armored personnel carriers, tanks, high caliber ammunition. <clears throat> Who are they getting ready to war with? Mm-hmm. Us. Mm-hmm. The, they understand that basically there's a, a, a crisis of legitimacy, that this system is in decline, that this backward racist capitalist system is, is, is coming apart. And so they're not concerned about uh, invasion from outside. They're concerned about containing us internally. And the way you contain us is by strengthening the first line of of defense, which are who? The police. Mm -hmm. So militarism that 
We see outside, we see inside. We've got to wake ourselves up to the fact that there's a war being waged and it's being waged against us and people of color all around this globe. And we've got to understand that there's a uh, war being waged against people of color, but there's a class element to that also. That war is being waged against all working people, all people without capital, by this, this minority, this, this capitalist oligarchy that will uh, fight uh, to the last drop of your blood and mine to maintain their dominance. And we say in the Black Alliance for Peace, now one drop of blood for, from the working class and the poor for the capitalist oligarchy, now one drop. Wow. That's a powerful message, man. Def- definitely a powerful message. I just wish more people would be able to hear it uh, to really appreciate what you're saying. I mean, I, when I put up the pie chart, Ajamu, of the spending, the projected spending, government spending, and it, and it shows this tiny slither for housing that even now Benjamin Carson wants to uh, triple the cost of uh, uh, low-income residents or uh, people on public assistance who get housing, triple uh, that their payments. You know, um, when I showed them that, compare all of the domestic spending on schools or or, uh, uh, or even our veterans. I mean, and you look at the chart for, for military spending, I mean, everything else that we do in America, everything from roads, everything could fit into a corner of what we spend on our military and just making people understand it. So I appreciate the way you broke that down because um, I, I don't think people are really getting the message. Um, someone, someone posted a comment here. <laughs> I'm just going to throw this out at you. Um, uh, always to learn. Um, they said, you do, would you consider running with Jesse Ventura? <laughs> 2020. <laughs> they always. <laughs> well, you know, um, it's funny because um, uh, Jesse Ventura is one of the reasons why they they con- cons- they conspired to keep me in jail out of the uh, debates when they thought that Jesse was not a serious candidate. Uh, he was polling something like three to five percent. Uh, they say, yeah, oh yeah, you could participate in the debate, no problem. We need some 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 entertainment. Well, we saw what happened. He won, you know, because when you start comparing him with his opponents, people are like, hey, wait a minute, what yeah. he's what he's talking about makes sense, you know. And the same thing, Tim, would have happened if we would have got a chance to stand next to, um, if Jill would have had a chance to stand next to Hillary Clinton. I got a chance to stand next to Tim Kaine and 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 the other one, you know. Yeah. Um, we would have had uh, it would have been more. It would have been very interesting what could have occurred. Okay, so now I, you know. Look, I, I'm gonna tell you. I'm about trying to build movement. I think the, ele- the electoral process uh, is a an area of contention. We need to participate in it. Uh, is a weapon we can use to help build alternative power. Myself as an individual, you know, uh, I have no particular interest in running for these in, in these these elections. You know, there's people who are talking to me about that possibility. You know, if if there was a if there was a if there was a strategic reason to do it, in terms of building and strengthening the Green Party, uh, uh, raising uh, these issues we've been articulating. Uh, and, and and people galvanize around that platform, maybe we could talk at that point. But I have no individual ambition, no burning desire to to take that plunge. Because Tim, it's difficult. I was on the, I was on the uh, campaign trail for just, just four months. And it was exhausting, you know, to to run for president, even with the Green Party, would would would, would take an 18 month commitment. Now I'm doing I'm doing too much other serious work. I mean that's serious, but you know I don't think I got that kind of time to devote just for that process. You know, so uh, I'm going to see. I'm going to try to get behind somebody maybe that uh, is willing to step out there and do this work. Uh, but as an individual, um, you know, I, I I don't know about that. I don't yeah. know. But, but let me say something something else. We've got to move away from this celebrity BS, mm. okay? The way you make social change is through organization. Building alternative organizational power for the masses is a protracted process. It takes time. We've got to build organization. We don't need any celebrity individuals. Nobody's going to save us. 
Mm. Okay. You build power by building organization. So that is not about who's at the top of the ticket, or anything like that. It's about what kinds of structures are you building? What kind of strategy do you have? Are you committed uh, for the long term struggle? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, they, and when you bring that up, that makes me think about the uh, the, the the Democratic Party. The, the liberals were jumping up, up and down, going, "Oh, Obama!" Tw- I mean, not Obama, Oprah. Well, same thing. Oprah twenty twenty, Oprah twenty twenty, because she gave a speech, and uh, I was and I pushed back so hard, uh, uh, Jamu. Um, it's not that I want to save the Democratic Party. I just think we need more parties. And uh, I had to speak out against Oprah, though. I mean, this is just ridiculous what we do. They said, well, you know, Trump won because he was popular, because he was a celebrity. Well, did the Democrats want to counter that with a with an Oprah run? And uh, it sounded ridiculous yeah, well, uh, to me. Trump won because Trump got $4 billion in free, uh, free airplane because part of the conspiracy was uh, on the part of the liberal media was to, in fact, make Trump the candidate. Because they had concluded that he would be the easiest one to defeat. Mm. You mean so, it wasn't? It wasn't you and Jill Stein, man. You, Jill Stein, Susan Sarandon. I thought y'all you put Trump in office. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, we we the ones that that uh, we're part of the the Russian conspiracy. You know. So no, it, it it's um I, I I I agree with you. I think that the the struggles inside the Democratic Party are important. Uh, I don't uh, dismiss those struggles. Uh, I think there are people who are serious about trying to reform their party. It remains to be seen if that's even possible. Uh, but there's some legitimate people who believe that there's still some hope uh, and, and, and shifting the power away from the uh, neoliberal corporate elite that right now has a grip on the party. And that's really been the issue with the, with the, uh, with the Democratic Party, that basically they, they move to the right, they have abandoned um, uh, the working class, abandoned working class uh, interests uh, and concerns. Uh, they still believe that they can uh, run by fielding a candidate like Oprah or a Biden or one of those kinds of milk toast candidates. And they still are, are scared of the, the, the possibility of a Bernie Sanders, uh, which, you know, it's, 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 it's very interesting. So, you know, either there's going to be um, uh, a progressive uh, Democrat or I believe the Democratic Party is going to split uh, in, in, in 2020 because I don't believe that those activists who are working so hard trying to reform the party uh, and make it more, uh, more, more democratic are going to allow themselves to be uh, subverted uh, again by the, by the elites of that party. And so I think this time uh, they won't make the mistake that Bernie Sanders made uh, by staying in that party. I think they're going to walk and, and walk in, in huge numbers. Well, you you know, um, there, there has been a lot of walking though so far. There's, you know, um, a lot of people. A lot of people have dim exited. Um, not most of those people have gone independent. I, I'm an independent currently, and I will remain one. I, now that I see clearly, I see clearly. I know that that's not a party for me. Um, I, um, gosh, I, I was thinking about Kamala Harris. Maybe I could get your take on on her potential run. I see I see Kamala Harris as Obama 2.0. Um I, I look at her work as in California. Um I, I'm not impressed. I mean though she's an intelligent person, I, I don't I'm not impressed with her uh, with her policies and and now everyone's saying, well hey, we won't take PAC money. You know, and and that's supposed to be the big thing, but there's more to it than that. What's your take on a Kamala Harris? I'm not impressed with any of the neoliberal candidates. Um, as you said, I think correctly, uh, Kamala Harris is basically Obama 2.0. If the Democrats aren't able to present a credible candidate that is willing to um, challenge neoliberal logic, uh, the neoliberal control of the party and the state, if they're not prepared to to embrace in a real way uh, policies that undermine the power of the corporate and financial sector, uh, if they're not prepared to oppose military adventurism, uh, then they are not a part, a serious party, and they're not going to make uh, progress in 2020. And I, I don't think that they're going to be, they're going to make progress because we've already seen the indications that they are not prepared to uh, to step away from their corporatist policies. The very fact that uh, Democrats voted in favor of the obscene increase in military spending 
uh, demonstrates once again that there is a bipartisan um, agreement on uh, uh, advancing the what they see as the uh, and the oligarchy. Um, so as long as the, the, the Democrats are in the pockets of Wall Street, uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to uh, get behind a progressive candidate, um, and they're going to. Uh, I think I think they will prefer to lose again, like they did with Bernie, uh, and that's supporting Bernie. That is, uh, I think they they I think the ruling element is prepared to uh, continue with a Trump or a Pence if Trump is is, is at, at that point uh, uh, impeached, uh, then to uh, allow power to shift toward uh, a progressive as limited as that progressive may be. I agree with you. I was going to ask you that question: What do you think about the Trump impeachment? I think you kind of answered it there. Do you, do you think there's a possibility they'll be able to do that with the powers of uh, the deep state? I think that um, I, I was I was I, I didn't think that they're going to be able to to to, to move against Trump a few months ago, uh, but I'm not sure about that now. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but I suspect though that uh, before Trump leaves, he will spark a constitutional crisis. I think um, if. Uh, if the uh, Mueller investigation really goes deeper into Trump's uh, personal finances, uh, that uh, he will end up uh, uh, firing him. And um, Mm. who knows what might happen. But I I, I suspect that there is a, there is uh, some powerful elements that are prepared to go ahead and take Trump out. And they want to do this before 2020, before 2018, that is. Um, and, um, I think if there's going to be, if the stuff is going to happen, it's going to happen within the next two months. Mm. Oh, you mean the, tw- the midterm? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the impeachment, the, the possible, it won't be an impeachment. They will, uh, uh, create a situation where he would, uh, uh want to resign. And the way that they, I thought we're going to do that was to go after members of his family. I thought that the target was, uh, Don Jr., uh, but that may not be the target. Um, so, and I think also the target was uh, Ivanka's husband, um, um, Jerry Kushner. Name? Jerry Kushner, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, because they know that Trump will fight them to the end, but the way you 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 deal with that is that you go after his family. Wow! Wow! Uh, John, well, man, you know I could talk to you for forever, man. I know, but you're a very busy guy. Um, is there anything that you would like to to alert the people to, direct them to, uh, to, to follow up or to get more information? Uh, if, if, if I hope people get a chance to go to the uh, our website, the Black Alliance for Peace, and check it out, see what we're trying to do, um, and and join if you if you are so inclined to support building a new progressive. Uh, revolutionary, uh, black anti-war, anti-imperialist, and anti-repression movement. We are serious about um, resistance. We're serious about um, uh, standing up for the interests of black and poor people and the working class in general. And in that seriousness, we understand we've got to be organized. So, you know, we understand that uh, without peace, you know, there could be no real progress. But we also understand that there could be no peace without justice and that to have justice, you have to fight for it and to be able to fight effectively for it, you've got to be organized. So check out the uh, the website, uh, join supporters, uh, let's build movement. I hope that people might consider coming down to the National Black Assembly. It's going to take place uh, May 18th through the 20th uh, in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, go online and get that information for that and check it out. Uh, we we'll see you all at the left forum. I'm doing the uh, closing plenary keynote speech. Uh, come check it out if you're in New York, gathering of, of, of leftists from across the country. Uh, we're going to keep on organizing, Tim, and building uh, because we believe in the, uh, the potential of the people. We, we believe in building power to the people. Wow. Well, well, well John, well, my friend. My brother, my friend, man, I appreciate you so much once again for coming on the show. I just want to leave you with one more last thing. The only time that seems like the Democrats like Trump is when he's dropping bombs, brother. That's the exactly. only time they back up off his ass, the job. So exactly. Exactly. I noticed that, man. Wow. Well, folks, you know what to do, man. Go find the uh, Black Alliance for Peace website. Is that a dot com, Ajamu? Yeah, 
dot com. Yeah. Dot com. Dot com. There you go. Blackalliancefopeace.com. Guys, go do that. Don't forget about the left forum. Find out about the assembly and get involved. Uh, Ajamu, uh, the Poor People's Movement, led by Reverend Barbara. Man, you, you, two, you two gentlemen are, are, are people that I deeply respect and look up to, man. And, and you inspire me every day. So please keep doing what you're doing. And don't hesitate. If you need anything that I can do, provide, man, don't hesitate to ask. I appreciate it, my brother. Yeah. You got we'll it. See you next time. You okay. You know it now. All right. All right, guys, that's it for us. Uh, I will be back Thursday. And uh, tune in 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another version of the Tim Black Show. Uh, I will see you soon. Uh, don't let nobody take your cornbread. What a show. What a show, guys. All right. We're still live, John Moo. All right, brother.